Thank you for joining the CAPS DGI 2022 launch webinar. I'm Stephanie Chang, Research Analyst at the Centre for Asian Philanthropy and Society, or CAPS. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few guidelines for today's webinar. You may notice that we are recording the session. The replay will be available through our website and YouTube on Friday. There is a Q&A session at the end. If you would like to ask a question, please type your questions in the Q&A box. And now I'd like to hand over to Ruth Shapiro, co-founder and chief executive of CAPS. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this afternoon's webinar. Um, before we get started, there's a few people I wanna thank. And first and foremost, I wanna thank everyone, the hundreds of people actually from around the world that are listening to me now and are showing interest in our work and their commitment to the social sector. So thank you so much. I wanna thank our partners from the 18 economies in which we do the Doing Good Index. Without their help, we couldn't do what we do. And um, uh, they are the unsung heroes in, in this work. I certainly wanna thank our donors. Um, some of whom are on this call, um, thank you very much. Without your support, uh, we couldn't do any of our work. And so keep it coming and feel free to increase it greatly. And lastly, I wanna thank the CAPS team. We have a wonderful team. And um, next to me is Dr. Analote Walsh, who will be co-presenting with me this afternoon. And um, I feel very lucky to work with such a gifted and um, enthusiastic group of people. So those are the thanks. And now on to the Academy Awards. Oh, wrong, wrong program. Okay, let me get back to the doing good index then. Um, this timing of, this, of the index this year is really important. We are coming out of a pandemic or hopefully coming out of a pandemic. And that means that we've learned some lessons along the way, and we really need to think of the world that we wanna create in a post-COVID world. One, where pandemics will, will undoubtedly happen again, where crises will happen again, where natural disasters will continue to happen, um, prompted by climate change. And so we really need to think about, and not just think, act upon, how we are working together, how we can improve, and what the Doing Good Index does is help us think about that. So I, I'm very happy that the timing of this launch is happening right when the world is beginning to emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we start with our findings, um, we just wanna show you a quick video. So if you'll just watch the screen, it should come on in a second. like that video, which I hope you did, um, did you know that CAPS also has a dedicated channel on YouTube? Feel free to sign up and you can see all of our wonderful videos like that, which hopefully inspire you and you'll like them and send them to everyone you know. Um, 
But anyway, now I would just like to ask, we have three poll questions throughout this webinar. Let's just ask you the first one. What is the main role of philanthropy in your opinion? You choose one of these. To address societal need, the government is unable to, to meet. Um, to innovate and pilot new solutions or to supplement government programs. Just give it another few seconds. We have a better participation rate than in most elections. Um, okay, so um, it's very clear that most of you feel that the primary role of philanthropy is to address societal needs the government is unable to meet or no one else is meeting, the so-called last mile. Um, but a fifth of you think that philanthropy is supposed to innovate and pilot new solutions. And that's, that's good and interesting. And it can do both, of course, at the same time. So we're gonna stop sharing that and go into our, um, our slides. Um, so we all know that we've been in a pandemic for close to three years. Those of us in Hong Kong have been, um, are still facing a week quarantine when we come back into this city. Um, and around the world, there's, ebbs and flows about people going to restaurants, meeting. What we saw throughout this pandemic is that people and companies stepped up to help. But we also know that the problems we're facing were greatly increased. COVID acted like a force multiplier for things like um, income disparity, educational disparity, the differences between the haves and the have nots only increased. Um, we know we need to do better. How can we do better? To solve our problems, we need to work together more effectively and more efficiently. But there's still a widespread trust deficit which contributes to mixed policies from government and inadequate funding. The Doing Good Index shows us a way forward. And let me just give you a very quick background to why we, why we do the Doing Good Index. When we were creating CAPS, we went around and spoke to numerous ultra high net worth philanthropists and business leaders. And we asked them, why don't you give more in your locality? And surprisingly, the answer whether the person was in Korea, Indonesia, India, across the entire region was, I don't trust the social sector. I don't trust the NGOs. I don't trust the organizations to receive money. Now, many of you work for nonprofits and you know that you are trusted by your community. So there seems to be a very big disconnect between the type of trust individual organizations um, have and appreciate and, and nurture and at the larger level. We need to increase trust. And so we developed the Doing Good Index to really think from a systemic level, what are the factors that can increase accountability, transparency? What can help increase trust such that money flows, government regulations are conducive and organizations can go on with the work that they're doing fully supported. And that's the background for this study, which many of you know, this is the third iteration of our biennial study. Um, and um, we're very pleased to share with you our findings. How can we do it? How can we in increase, allow the, the social sector to flourish? How can we do the work we need to do to do it better, to be better? Well, the index gives us three sets of tools. One, we can mitigate the trust deficit. We need to increase trust between the social sector and donors, be they government or 
companies or individuals. Um, and we need to increase trust, you know, for from the social sector for companies and government as well. The trust goes all the way around. We need to leverage local support. And we're going to talk a lot about how we can um, just it, how we can just increase local giving for, to address local issues. That's a big theme of this year's index. Um, and then the third, we need to facilitate cross-sector collaboration. We know that our problems are complicated. And there's a term for really complicated problems. Many of you I'm sure have heard of wicked problems. We have a lot of wicked problems and no one sector by themselves can solve them. We need cross-sector collaboration, tri-sector. We need the three legs of the stool, the government, the private sector, and the social sector working together co to co collaborate, to fix problems, and draw on their comparative strength so that we work together more efficiently, efficiently and more impactfully. Okay, so the Doing Good Index. Last year, the, in 2020, we were able to cover 18 economies, 16 countries plus Hong Kong and Taiwan. Unfortunately, this year, Myanmar was not able to join as part of the index, but in the report, which you can download from our website now, um, there is a section on Myanmar and our hearts go out to the people in that, in that country um, who are really struggling with some very difficult times. With the help of our partners, we were able to survey 2,239 social delivery organizations. Now, we use this term SDOs, and many people say, what is that? So let me just explain. Um, maybe someone can come up with a better term, but we know that nonprofit isn't exactly right. Many of the nonprofits we work with have a profitable income stream, and that's terrific. Also, many of the organizations that are on the front lines doing work are social enterprises, which may be nonprofit or for profit. So the term nonprofit doesn't quite work. What about the term NGO? Well, in many Asian economies, our NGOs are actually GOs, they are linked to the government in one way or another. So it's not quite right to say non-governmental organizations. So we went with social delivery organizations, whether they're nonprofit, for-profit, linked to the government or independent, these are the organizations on the front lines of delivering social services and products to those who most need it. That's who we're talking about. That is the group that filled out this survey. And, I, and for those of you on this webinar, who did fill out the survey, heartwarm appreciation and thanks. With the help of our partners, we also interviewed 126 experts across the 18 economies. Myanmar was able to convene an expert panel. And these experts help us with issues like taxes and um, the regulatory environment. And what are the specific rules of the game in each of the economies? Um, I also just want to mention one other definition. We use the term private social investment. And what we mean by that is that philanthropy doesn't quite cover all the ways in which private resources are brought to bear on doing good. CSR is also important. In Asia, where a lot of companies have a dominant shareholder, which is a family or a state, much philanthropy personal philanthropy can throw, flow through the company. And we also know that companies are doing a lot more and we're going to address that in the presentation. Private social investment also includes impact investing, blended finance. So we wanna have as expansive of a view of how private resources can be brought to bear on doing good as possible. And that's why we use the term private social investment. The Doing Good Index is made up of four key sets of indicators. Three of them really have to do with the government, the regulatory environment, tax and fiscal policies, and procurement from government, procurement by government 
with the social sector. Ecosystem really talks about the, the kind of societal embrace of philanthropy, of social sector organizations, of working in the community. How much does, do the people, the community, the corporation appreciate and embrace this kind of activity? So the ecosystem sub indicator tells us that. In this year's it, report, we also have a big section on the impact of COVID, which has been profound. And I think all of us recognize that we've been in somewhat of a kind of a numb holding pattern, waiting for the, for the pandemic to be over to return to normal lives. Well, while we may return to normalcy in some ways, we, our world has been rocked forever and we need to think of new systems and new approaches. So we at CAPS, that's what we're here for. That's what we're about. We're, we welcome your ideas. We welcome your suggestions. We welcome your thoughts on what we should be looking at to really find those strategies and those models that work best within the Asia region. That is our remit. And we want to study them. We want to promote what works. And we want to share those ideas. But before that, let's share the findings from the Doing Good Index. And for that, I'm going to ask my colleague, Anna Lute Walsh, to really walk us through what we found in the Doing Good Index 2022. Thank you, Ruth. So yes, let's turn to the findings of the Doing Good Index. And let's first look at how the 17 economies fared. As you can see from the slide, the economies are and categorized in four groups, in four clusters, not doing enough, doing okay, doing better and doing well. And please note that the countries and economies are listed in alphabetical order here. As mentioned by Ruth, you can consider each of these clusters as an indication of the extent to which government policies and society is embracing philanthropy and the social sector and see it almost as a journey of, um, towards doing better towards doing good. So let's look at each of these clusters. The top cluster is the doing well cluster and Singapore and Taiwan maintain in this position and have stayed there since our inaugural report in 2018. Both economies do well because government is really embracing the social sector. They work together with them and they see them as a partner in addressing social issues. Both economies have enabling regulations and positive and attractive tax incentives. Singapore, for example, has the highest tax incentive rate at 250%. That means that for every dollar that is donated to a charity by an individual or a corporate in Singapore, two and a half dollars is tax free. No other economy in Asia can match that. In fact, in the world. Exactly. Right. Taiwan doesn't do bad either, and they have a 100% tax incentive rate. And it is also only one of four economies that incentivizes charitable giving through bequests. But even though Singapore and Taiwan perform the best um, and are leading the way in Asia, there's still room for improvement for both, especially when it comes to government procurement and attracting talent to the sector. In fact, there is a category called doing excellently and no one has made that. So let us throw down the gauntlet for all of you who are listening that we want some or all of the economies in Asia to reach the doing excellently category. Thank you. <laughs> the next category is doing better um, and with six economies. Hong Kong, Japan, Korea and the Philippines have maintained their position in this cluster, whereas Malaysia and China have moved up from doing okay in 2020 to doing better in 2022 mostly due to changes in the area of regulatory frameworks and ecosystem. The economies in the doing better category perform well in some areas, but can do better in others. The social sector in these economies is generally supported and encouraged by government, and most perform above average when it comes to regulations, but for different reasons. Setting up an SDO is relatively quick and easy in Malaysia, but it can take up to a year in Hong Kong. On the other hand, laws and regulations are easy to understand in Hong Kong, whereas these are very difficult to understand in Japan and Korea. 
And while China has a single body overseeing social sector organizations, Korea has up to 50, uh, 43 regulatory bodies overseeing the sector. And all six economies have relatively favorable tax incentives, but room for improvement in all to remove limits. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. The next cluster is doing okay. It is the largest cluster, and it has also seen the most movements in the past two years. Only India, Indonesia, and Thailand have maintained their position. Nepal and Cambodia moved up a cluster, mostly due to improvements on government procurement in the case of Nepal, and um, tax incentives, and if for Cambodia due to improvements on the regulatory and ecosystem sub-indices. Pakistan and Vietnam dropped down. In their cases, this was mainly due to tax incentives and governance um, areas. Most economies in this cluster score below average on regulations and the tax sub-indices. And there is really quite a bit of improvement there for all these economies. While all economies except for Cambodia offer tax incentives, they all also place limits on these tax incentives. And as I said, I'll go into that and explain that a little bit more later on. There is also significant variation in the ease of setting up SDOs and understanding the laws um, around um, the social sector. The final category is not doing enough. Two new economies in 2022, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, both of which have dropped down from doing um, okay. And both countries, although they do well in some areas, there is a lot of improvement along most um, multiple areas. Sri Lanka, although they are one of the top performers when it comes to regulations, there is a lot of improvement um, on the other three indices. For Bangladesh, it was already performing at the bottom of the doing okay cluster in 2020, but due to the deteriorating challenges or the challenges in the deteriorating environments caused by COVID, it has been dropped down. But as the economy is starting to recover, we also hope that its performance in 2024 will improve. So we have a poll question here before we start looking at um, how exactly countries can do better. My colleague will pull this up. Do you believe that the social sector is becoming more creative and innovative? We'll give it a few more seconds. Okay. Um, I think it's clear to see that at least there is somewhat creativity and innovation, but the majority of you just said yes, somewhat. I think this, is, well, we can speak to this a little bit more but later on. I would like to say that, you know, info at caps.org or my email, Ruth at caps.org. If you think there's a great example of a particularly creative or innovative um, social delivery organization, philanthropic initiative that the world needs to know about, please drop us a line. We'd love to hear about it. Thank you. Okay, so let's get back to how can we do better? Now we've seen these three areas before. Um, and Ruth already touched uh, on it a little bit. So let's look at them in a little bit more detail. As mentioned, we know that trust as an impediment to giving is an issue often raised by donors. And the Doing Good Index equips us with, with tools and strategies to mitigate this trust. Specifically- Mitigate the deficit. The we trust don't deficit. Mit yeah, we don't <laughs> want to mitigate the trust. <laughs> mitigate the trust deficit. Right. Specifically, I want to talk about four ways in which this can be done. By transparency and accountability through regulations, through corporate engagement, by building trust of the social sector organizations themselves, and by attracting talent. Let's look at regulations first. Regulations are important. Why? Because they can really help build transparency and accountability. Having rules and laws in place that require senior leadership or that hire 
require senior leadership to be held accountable, that require organizations to file annual reports and audited accounts, and are just some examples of ways in which the transparency accountability of the sector can be built. The good news is that this is happening. 16 economies hold senior leadership accountable, and four economies require submission. 14, 14 economies require submission of annual reports and are audited accounts. Whilst, the, whilst these reporting requirements are great, not all economies require these to be made publicly available or make them publicly available themselves. And that's a shame. But this is not something that SDOs can have to wait for for governments to change, and they can take matters into their own hands. They can make these reports available themselves and show their, their donors and their audience and their networks that they are working above boards and to make these available through their websites. Another point I want to touch upon briefly here is front page scandals. We really know that one rotten apple can really um, spoil the barrel when it comes to scandals involving the social sector. And a, a scandal that involves mismanagement of fund, donated funds can really have direct negative impact on the sector as a whole. And we see that happening. Unfortunately, nine economies in the past two years saw such a front page scandal. And we really do hope that regulations can help um, prevent that moving forward. While regulations are important, we also know that finding the right balance when it comes to regulations is a challenge, and it's important that this balance is found. If, challenge, if regulations are changing too much, if they are difficult to understand, or if they are implemented without um, considering the broader implications of them, they can have a real negative effect on the sector. Over the past two years, we have seen that many Asian governments have struggled finding a balance between competing objectives. On one hand, they are implementing regulations to help increase transparency and encourage private investment into the sector. At the same time, they are trying to maintain control and oversight of the organizations. Take, for example, foreign funding. Foreign funding to SDOs was in decline even before COVID happened, but this is trend has accelerated. I will talk a bit more about foreign funding later on, but the point here is that nine economies saw changes to related to the receipt of foreign funding in the past two years. And in all these cases, it has made it more difficult for these organizations to receive foreign funding. So while regulations can encourage transparency and accountability, they can also sometimes make it more difficult to receive um, for private funding to flow into the sector. And this is worrisome at a time when money is needed more than ever before. Another way the trust deficit can be mitigated, as shown by the good, Doing Good Index, is through corporate engagement. But let me just take a step back and talk about the changing role of companies in society. Companies are increasingly called upon by governments and society to help address growing social and environmental issues. And companies are responding. They are reevaluating the role in society and taking action, whether through their own efforts or by engaging with social sector organizations. The DGOI shows that this is happening. SDOs believe that companies are supportive of them and they are receiving corporate funding. And this has increased in the past two years, which is great. But beyond the importance of funding, companies can interact with social sector organizations in other ways as well, especially through cross uh, skills transfer between the two. As you can see, 62% of SDOs have board members with corporate experience and 53 have corporate volunteers. These people bring with them skills, skills like um, leadership and governance, business acumen, legal knowledge and skills, accounting, technology, all of which are extremely important for social sector organizations. And so this, this interaction can be a real win-win for both um, parties. Building trust can be made easier if social sector organizations have the capacity themselves to measure their impact and to communicate their value to their donors and to the broader public. 
And with the rise of technology and, today, and today's interconnected world, the way that businesses and SDOs carry out their work has changed. And social sec sector organizations have to adapt to that. But all of this requires specific skills. Many um, and many SDOs lack these skills and they need to be supported and um, to build the capacity of their staff. Unfortunately, not many donors understand this and our findings show that only 16% of donors consistently support capacity building and then only 11% support communication expenses for SDOs. And let me just stop here for another and our final quick poll question. What role does social media play for you in your organization? Is it an asset set? Okay, almost. Okay, thank you. Um, interesting that for most organizations, the majority, um, it is definitely an asset, but there's a few people that are on the fence and- We are also on the fence. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's a new world. And I think many organizations, including CAPS, is figure, trying to figure out how to maximize social media. Um, so uh, we look forward to learning more about this. So we hope that donors understand that in order for social sector organizations to address social problems, they must also support capacity building. They must support organizations to measure their impact and to tell their stories. This in turn will build trust and, and then in turn, and drive funding to the sector. Create a virtuous cycle. A virtuous cycle. Right. The last point here is about talent. Now, talent retention and talent acquisition is a challenge across the region. For any social sector organization to do good work, you need to have good people, but those good people are difficult to find. And as you can see, most SDOs that we surveyed struggled to find and recruit staff. And that has actually gotten more difficult in the past two years. Contributing factors to this difficulty is the perception that nonprofit staff should earn less than their for-profit counterparts. And that perception is grounded in reality. <laughs> <laughs> and well, well, competitive salaries and bonuses are, are the norm in the corporate sector. It's quite frowned upon when large bonuses or salaries are paid in the nonprofit sector with the feeling that that money should probably be going to people on the work that the organizations are doing. But why do people want to work for the sector? Usually it's because they have a passion and because they have a drive and they're willing to take a pay cut for that, which is great. But people also need to pay their bills and and develop professionally and so ensuring the that organizations have the ability to pay competitive salaries and also offer staff and um, professional development will really help them keep re recruit them in the first place and help them retain retain them over time so we are we just spoke about mitigating the trust deficit but as mentioned before the COVID pandemic has really exacerbated inequalities and funding and support to the sector is needed more than ever before. And the Doing Good Index shows us what levers can be pulled to leverage this support. I just wanna take a step back here and just talk specifically about funding. Um, funding is of the utmost importance for any organization working in the sector. The great majority of SDOs were already cash strapped before the pandemic hit, and that has gotten even worse. And why? Many different reasons. Um, multiple and simultaneous needs over the past two years has really resulted in a shift in funding sources. Um, another contributing factor is the zero sum nature of COVID funding. The financial support for COVID relief efforts was in most cases not additional funding, 
but it was redirecting funding away from other program areas towards COVID relief. And while that trend has to some extent been reversed, it is not fully the case. And many organizations working in the non-COVID related areas are really struggling to get back to pre-COVID levels of funding. One source of funding that has seen particularly particular changes in the past two years is foreign funding. While this has traditionally not been a important source of funding for economies in East Asia, it has been a very important source of funding for economies in for SDOs in South and Southeast Asia. And this source of funding has been declining steadily in the recent years. As you can see in the past two years, foreign funding as a proportion of an SDO's budget has declined significantly. In fact, it has declined in all but 14 economies. The decline can be attributed to several factors, including an overall increase in the affluence of Asian economies, which has resulted in decreasing levels of official ODA, but also as a result of the tightening on controls of money flowing in. And this is what I mentioned earlier, nine economies saw tightening of rules of money coming into the sector, making it more difficult for these organizations, for organizations in these countries to receive this type of money. But overall, economies saw a decline in funding across the board. In a report, you can read about some of the ways in which the social sector is adjusting to that and ways in which they are responding to this. But what is clear is that more funding is needed. And this is where I want to talk about some of the ways in which that can be incentivized. The first area is tax incentives. The tax and fiscal policy sub-index of the Doing Good Index most closely mirrors overall performance on the index, which really speaks to the importance of tax incentives in fostering and driving money to the sector. Tax incentives are important for two reasons. Firstly, they put real money back in the pockets of donors. But secondly, tax incentives have a very strong signaling effect. In Asia, where governments, um, and institution, where governments and institutions tend to work in tandem, rather the um, government signals really matter. And tax incentives send a strong message of support. The good news is tax incentives are in place in almost all economies. Singapore offers, as I mentioned, the highest rate at 250%. But 11 other economies offer a tax incentive rate of 100%. The remaining countries offer lower rates, and Cambodia is the only economy that does not offer tax incentive for individual donors, but they do offer this for corporate donations. The problem with tax incentives in Asia is that even if a company or a, a government offers 100% tax uh, tax incentive rate, they are limiting the amount of income which is eligible for the deduction. And almost all economies, 15 out of 17, place such a limit on the tax incentives. And some even as low as 2%. In Thailand, corporate deductions are only applicable to 2% of a company's income. Other countries or in economies limit the sectors to which these deductions are available. For example, in Sri Lanka, tax deductions are only available to organizations that work or provide service for child and elderly care. And while limiting the sectors can be beneficial to help direct funding towards specific areas of need, it can also have a very distorting market effect and exclude important social areas. As mentioned previously, there's an increasing pressure on companies to care more about social and environmental issues and to adopt a stakeholder approach. This changing role is driven by consumer demands and, and by companies reevaluating their own role in society, but it is also driven by government requirements and financial market mechanisms. 
government policies encouraging and mandating corporate social responsibility and ESG reporting are important levers through which governments can help drive corporate engagement. And we are seeing this happen. Eight stock exchanges in Asia have ESG reporting requirements. And two economies go as far as to mandate a specific CSR spending amount, India and Nepal. And, and India actually follows through with it. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we encourage other economies to follow this path and to encourage more stock exchange requirement, ESG requirements and CSR mandated giving. A final way of encouraging doing good is through recogni recognizing it, through awards, through economy-wide um, volunteering schemes and national giving days. And here, most economies do really well. As you can see, 14 economies have awards for philanthropy and another 15 um, recognize best-in-class corporate social responsibility. One area for improvement is nationwide giving days. Only seven out of 17 economies have such a day. Yet, when 73% of these social sector organizations we interviewed said that they believe a nationwide giving day would help improve giving in their economy. So this is something Asian governments can think about. And private sector companies in China, the national giving day, one of the biggest is 10 cents. So it need not only be the government, it can be a company that drives this forward. The third part that we wanna talk about today is cross-sector collaborations. Collaborations between social sectors were already common before COVID. In fact, 77% of SDOs collaborated with others. And, and when asked what the nature of this collaboration was, they said mostly to deliver services, to advocate for joint cause, or to build capacity. But COVID further accelerated this trend and 55% of SDOs entered into new collaborations with others during COVID. Who did they collaborate with? As you can see, with corporates and with other SDOs, but mainly with government and then different levels of government. This includes local and regional and national governments. And when we asked uh, the SDOs and experts about the nature of these collaborations, it was clear that it was uh, often very ad hoc, informal, and at a community level. And this is an area, and we will speak to this a bit more, where this can be um, institutionalized and, and further developed. As mentioned before, governments in Asia loom large. People and companies tend to work in tandem with government. And the economies that tend to do well in the index are those where government sees the sector as a partner and works with it. Working together can be of mutual benefit. Take, for example, procurement. Procurement means that the government is directly outsourcing the, the delivery of social services to the social sector. For example, in Hong Kong, where health services are often outsourced to social sector organizations, or in other par parts of Asia where governments may set up a school, but then nonprofits come in to run these schools. Such collaborations are win-win for both. Governments can utilize the skills and the expertise of these organizations while also encouraging growth and legitimizing them. And finally, the SDOs themselves can really benefit from the income stream, the stable income stream um, offered through these um, procurement contracts. Overall procurement, um, government procurement has slightly increased between 2020 and 2022, which is positive. And as you can see, China really stands out as one of the highest um, countries with the highest level of government procurement. And let me just uh, make a mention here. Whenever I give this statistic, inevitably somebody will say, isn't this China essentially controlling the social sector? And you would think that, except that the social sector itself does not feel controlled. And um, the organizations in China who respond to our study appreciate that. So they feel that government is supporting them as much more than controlling them. So I just want to say that um, controls in the eyes of the recipient, I suppose, um, when, when looking at this very significant number from China. Yeah. 
But as you can see, um, other um, economies such as Philippines and Sri Lanka have very little government procurement and there's a lot of room for growth there. But beyond procuring services, governments can also consult and engage directly with SDOs through policy consultations, asking these organizations themselves what they need and ways to adopt more effective policies can be really helpful and can avoid tipping the balance of regulations the wrong side. Encouragingly, this is happening and 69% of surveyed SDOs reported at least some involvement in policy making. What is important though, as expressed by our experts, is that this consultation should be meaningful and actually really lead to results and that it should also be representatives and that organizations across the sector should be consulted. And with that, I'd like to hand the baton back over to Ruth to speak about the next slide. Okay, I just want to give you a heads up that I have two more slides and then we're going to do Q&A. So if you have a question, which I do, hope you do, or a comment, please um, send it through the Q&A box. Um, so this is our term. I don't think I've seen it anywhere else. The new Venn diagram. Um, we really want to increase the size of the middle. We want to figure out how the public sector, the private sector, and the social sector can work together better. Um, and it seems so intuitive, but for all of us who have tried to traverse those sectors, it's a lot easier said than done. However, we're seeing a great deal of experimentation and innovation happening in Asia now. Asia's the second most targeted region for blended finance, accounting for 36% of all blended finance transactions. And for those of you who haven't heard that term, um, well, first, we did a report on blended finance, which is available on our website. It's often not called blended finance in Asia, but what it is is, you, is essentially using market capital to address social issues. And there's a lot of really kind of interesting, innovative programs from around Asia taking place and all available in our study. We also poll a, a group of ultra high net worth individuals and we ask them if they intend to engage more in PPPs, public private partnerships for social good. And 88% of them, very large number said yes. Now PPPs for social good are not that intuitive. Most public-private partnerships historically were around the building of a dam or a toll road or some very large infrastructure project. And when those projects happen, there's a very clear exit and there's a very clear upside for the companies and the government to get together. PPPs for social good usually don't have as clear of an ending. What's gonna allow the company to leave or are they signing on in perpetuity? And we also did a study, this, this seems like a commercial for cops, but we did do a study on public-private partnerships, which show that the best ones really do think about the governance, the exits, and what they're trying to accomplish within the lifespan of the public-private partnerships for social good. We think that these type of arrangements are going to be on the rise. I also want to note that in every one of these PPPs for social good, there was an SDO that was either purpose built for that organization or an existing organization, an existing SDO that was brought into the mix. So PPPs for social good do embrace all three sectors in a, in a really interesting and important way. And lastly, we have somewhat of a call to action. In this study, you can see that there's a role for everyone to do better. What can governments do? They can write, they can write better regulations. When an overwhelming majority of the people don't understand the regulations, then those regulations aren't particularly effective. Um, and I've seen a number of the government websites. Governments often respond and say, well, it's on our website, but if you still can't understand it, even if it's on the website, then it's incumbent on the governments to make it much more easy to understand. They can look at the taxes. By offering tax subsidies at all, the government is in effect saying, we believe that these organizations should exist and we believe that philanthropic support coming from either individuals or corporations 
should go to them. So don't not don't shoot yourself in the foot. Understand how to make these tax incentives, which most, in fact, all of them, all of the economies in our study have to one extent or another, make them as useful as possible. We want to maximize the fact that government is foregoing income and make that that, that, that differential as meaningful as possible. And lastly, as Anna Lotte said, governments in Asia loom large. Donors in Asia do not wanna fund contrary to government. They wanna fund aligned and often in partnership with government. Therefore, government signaling about what's important really matters. What can businesses do? Well, of course they can provide money. Um, and I encourage them to do so, especially for us, but not only for us, for many grassroots organizations that really need the additional support. But as Anna Lotte said, businesses can also provide skills. One of the big issues for social delivery organizations is that they may not have rigorous business skills among their staff, but these skills can be learned. And many nonprofit social enterprise staff want to learn these skills. So businesses can, can provide them by, through their board members, through allowing volunteers to do more. Not, yes, it's great to partner and have a volunteer day where you clean up a beach or paint a school, and that's terrific. But allowing your accounting staff to really go in and help organizations improve their accounting systems, that's also meaningful. And businesses can engage in partnerships with government, with the private, with the social sector, and as I just mentioned, most of the time with both. And what can social sector organizations do? Well, of course, they can engage and they can build trust. We get questions all the time. How can I raise more money? What, what can I do to get more support? Well, you can tell your story better and you can understand your impact, have a terrific website, engender trust. Those organizations that really do a better job of engendering trust by telling the donor, this is where your money is going. This is the impact it's having. Find it much more easy to fundraise. It's intuitive. So I, I call upon SDOs to do a better job of telling their story and making the world understand the vital role that they play in our communities and in helping the most vulnerable. So with that, I want, I want to just turn to the question and answer. And um, we have a number of questions, but I'd like to encourage you to send more. Um, let's start with one from Christina Tung. She points out accurately that Hong Kong is one of the few um, economies that allows the tax exempt money to be sent out from Hong Kong. Um, that's true. And that is one of the, how many, how many um, indicators do we have in the doing good index? In total? Mm. It's a trick question. <laughs> it is a I trick think, question. <laughs> I think it's something like 166 or something like that. There, there's a lot of indicators. <laughs> and one of them is about money going out. So I want to assure you, Christina, that um, this is taken into account when we look at where, uh, uh, when we um, analyze the, um, the numbers and look at the statistics and place Hong Kong in the, um, in the second tier. And I agree with you, Hong Kong should move up, but there's a number of problems to be fixed. Yes. Um, if, I, if I may just add to that, um, Hong Kong's performance on regulations um, is, is one area where, although laws are very easy to understand, um, that is probably the index where they, uh, sub-index where they can see the most improvement. We have another question as to why China moved up in the index. Um, China has pushed back on foreign funding. I think all of us um, uh, in Hong Kong are certainly aware of that and many, donors from around the world know that it's very difficult. In fact, in 2018, 39% of the SDOs that were polled said that they got foreign funding in China and it was down to 8% this year. So huge difference. 
What's interesting about China, though, is that they put into effect a new charity law that did increase accountability and transparency. China has built up domestic funding and support, both through procurement, as, as Anna Lotte showed you, but also by convincing um, philanthropists, be they foundations or corporations, to do more. And they are doing more. So um, most organizations have not felt significant um, decrease in their funding in China because local money has grown. India has pushed back on foreign money and put into place um, CSR um, rules. And I think many of you know that the top 18,000 or so companies in, Indi in India must give 2% of their funding to um, to, to SDOs, to nonprofit organizations. Um, that hasn't quite um, filled the gap for foreign organizations because a lot of these companies give only in their, in their operational footprint. Um, so they're not necessarily out in the poor areas. And because there's been other funding mechanisms, for example, um, the Prime Minister Modi created something called PM Cares during COVID, which um, uh, uh, attracted quite a bit of the CSR funding in India. Yeah, um, I, I can address a question where someone's asking about access to the details of the report, which is available on various channels. Um, so I do encourage you to go to our website. We will put up the links on our website back up in a minute, but um, on our website, www.caps.org, you can access the report. And we also have an interactive microsite where you can play around with the data, you can compare economies performance with other economies, and you can compare um, an economy's performance in 2022 with the same economy in 2020. Um, and that the link to that will also be um, shared, I think at the end um, of the presentation. So please hold on. Otherwise you can also get there through our website. Um, so there's a question about the funding that was raised by governments during the pandemic. Um, and was there additional tax benefit to donors? Some governments did um, give additional tax benefits. And as Anna Lotte mentioned, governments sometimes say you can get a tax benefit for giving to this issue or this type of program, but not this one. And that is a way to channel funding. Sometimes those, those restrictions really help to get some money to a needy organization. Um, and that happened during the pandemic. But um, of course, there are problems because it, those, that funding is often zero sum. Um, many philanthropists did not give more, but they diverted to um, uh, to pandemic, you know, PPEs and hospitals and the, the provision of masks and all of that at the beginning. Now it's starting to come back. Um, and I just want to um, say that the, the, one of the areas that we really didn't talk about that much is that in, in some countries, not so much in Asia, a lot of the donors moved from project-based support to operational support during the pandemic. That happened in my home country in the United States in a fairly significant way. And for those of us who are running nonprofits, we were not as, we did not find it as easy to deliver on our projects in exactly the same way as we had promised donors before the pandemic and we needed that extra wiggle room. We needed um, some understanding and support from those that supported our organization so that um, we could respond, we could pivot. So, um, so I just encourage donors who are on this call to think about um, operational support versus project support. It can be really, really helpful. I see there's a question about doing excellent and what the criteria are to becoming excellent um, and whether there's any room for improvement if in Taiwan. Well, 
there's definitely room for improvement in Taiwan. Um, and um, I think the, the criteria for doing excellent, they're not set in stone. Every country at this stage or every economy, there is room for improvement. When it comes to Taiwan specifically, um, the several areas, and I briefly touched upon this, but for example, talent is a very big problem in Taiwan. The, the number of SDOs that find um, recruiting and retaining talent is significantly higher than in other areas in uh, compared to other countries and they also perform fairly uh, relatively lower on procurement and um, with it being fairly difficult to access ins information about procurement uh, opportunities and to win these opportunities and um, so there's the obstacles but there's also the lack of certain incentives taiwan does not if I um, offer incentives for um, giving um, bequest giving and a few of other things like that. So on one hand, it would be a removal of barriers, but at the same time, there is also room for implementing more um, enabling um, incentives. There's a question um, from our friend Rory Tolentino, who's also one of our partners from the Philippines about our poll question on social media. And actually it was the situation in the Philippines that prompted this question. Um, many of you may know that social media played a very significant role in the um, recent election results in, in the Philippines. Um, and the Philippines, I think is the, 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 the society, Filipinos are, are the people who are most online in the world. Um, I also have mixed, mixed feelings about the role of social media if you think about what it's doing in the United States. Um, so we asked that question essentially to get the sense about whether people think it's a it's it's a overall a plus. Um, we want to better understand how social media is changing our world, how we're using it, how we're getting used by through it. Um, and so we 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 welcome ideas about how to look at this issue because certainly it's not going away. It's becoming more pervasive and um, and that can be good or it can be bad and we want to understand that better. So um, Rory, I can't answer your question. We, we, we wanted to take a pulse of, of the crowd to see if there was enough there there interest in social media as, as, as an issue that's something we should look forward to. And um, there's also a question around um, PPPs, public-private partnerships, which we can address. The question is, have you seen any other potential PPPs that are non-infrastructure, but address wider social issues or root causes such as gender equality, inequality? Um, yes, absolutely. And um, uh, to further our ad and to say uh, um, what Ruth said, please, uh, I recommend that you take a look of, at our um, public-private partnership report, because in that report, we give a lot of examples of some excellent public-private partnerships that are non-infrastructure based. And traditionally, when, when people talk about public-private partnership, there is this association with infrastructure. But when it comes to social issue, there are a lot of great examples in education, in health, but also in human rights. And we feature one example um, in Cambodia around the labor rights in the clothing and factories uh, in Cambodia, where a public-private partnership was um, helping um, working with the factories to improve the labor rights there. So, Well, the government realized that they wouldn't be able to get international contracts unless they up their game when it came to the, work, the, the the labor conditions of the employees in those factories. And so they built a public-private partnership um, that is, um, that's been very powerful in helping to improve the conditions. So yes, and I, I think the link has just been shared. So we recommend that you take a look at that. Uh, okay, well, um, so we have one last question, which is, um, why we do the Doing Good Index every two years instead of every year. Well, if we did it every year, we would we, <laughs> we would go crazy and, and our partners would divorce us. Um, but also, um, there's, there's usually not that much change in the regulatory environment. This couple, last couple of years, of course, there has been. Um, a lot of changes have taken place under the umbrella of COVID-19. 
how might how many of those changes will stay in place once um, the pandemic, once we don't uh, have to worry about catching it or or getting really sick from it, um, that remains to be seen. Um, but I think that um, and and India has obviously had a, quite a bit of change in the last two years, um, but most cha regulatory changes don't happen that quickly that you should do this study every year. So that's why we do it every two years. And it seems like as soon as we finish now, um, we'll be meeting with our partners um, in, in the fall to discuss the next one. So it, it happens pretty quickly. Um, but we do think that the, the, the as, as Analote said, there is so much data in this study. And we really encourage you to dive in, to read it, to play with the microsite, to compare, we can, you can compare countries, you can compare 22, DGI 2020 and DGI 2022. Um, so um, please take a look and, um, and we will also be doing um, separate events in each of the participating economies where we will talk about specifically how that country or economy fares within the index. This, this webinar has been the regional, the big view, the Asia-wide view, but we um, will be addressing. So watch for those, those will be announced. For those of you who are on this call and don't get our newsletter, I can't imagine that that's the case, but sign up through our website and then you'll find out where we're doing these um, country or economy specific events. So, I want to um, once again thank our partners, thank our donors, thank all of you for spending some time with us this afternoon. Um, we hope that you have found this of interest. Um, we hope you think it's important and we welcome your comments, your suggestions and your partnership going forward. So thank you very much. Yes, and if you do have any further questions or feedback, you can email us at research at caps.org. Thank you.